No my haremai, welcome to Atonis Podcast, Insights with Tawiwi Members. And I am your host, Miriam Joyasessa. Today we are joined by Fiona McNamara from the Sexual Abuse Prevention Network in Wellington. Kia ora. So we've got a series of questions that we, go, we will go through and the first one is, tell us about who you are and where you work. Cool. Yeah, so I am Fiona McNamara. Um, I was born in Wellington um, and I live and work here now. I've lived here most of my life. I've lived a little bit of time overseas in Germany as well. And I work at the Sexual Abuse Prevention Network where I'm the general manager and I've been there about five and a half years. So tell us more about the services that the Sexual Abuse Prevention Network offers. Sure. So we are a charitable trust and um, I'll just tell you a little bit about the background of SAPIN first because it's quite interesting. So SAPIN was founded by three other agencies. So there's a Wellington Rape Crisis, Wellington Sexual Abuse Help Foundation and Wellstop. And it was founded in the early 2000s when those three agencies came together wanting to do something and preventing sexual violence because rape crisis and help work with survivors of sexual abuse and Wellstop works with people who've done sexual harm. So they wanted to um, do something to stop all that harm happening in the first place. And so in the early 2000s, the groups came together and um, at that time started doing some research and various bits and pieces of education and, and prevention work. The first sort of big piece of education that we still base what we're doing on was the pilot of the Sex and Ethics program in 2009. So that's a program written by Moira Carmody from the University of Western Sydney, but it was piloted here in Wellington through what was then called the Wellington Sexual Abuse Network, but is now the Sexual Abuse Prevention Network. So um, that pilot was sort of the beginning of growing us into what we are now. When I started here in 2013, my employment was overseen by rape crisis and I was the sole person doing the prevention work with a couple of contractors working on a very casual basis, so not very frequently for SAPA. And then we also used some of the staff from Rape Crisis and Help and Wellstop to do some of that education work as well. But since then, we've grown enormously, and now we are a, a much larger organisation. So we now have seven employees, six of which are full-time, one is part-time. And we often have a placement student working with us too. And we have about 14 casual educators doing education work, most of which is in high schools, but some also are doing professional development and work with other communities as well. So thank you, Fiona, also for giving that background because uh, it's really interesting to see and hear the evolution of an organisation mm -hmm. and what the thinking was behind the development of back then the Wellington Sexual Abuse Network and now this um, the Sexual Abuse Prevention Network. And I'm wondering if you could also tell us about the range of programs that you're currently delivering in and in which areas you're currently delivering in. Yes, yeah, so we run um, about 10 different programs and sort of standard forms, but we also tailor and adapt them based on the organisation and group that we're working with. So at, at the moment, the program we're running the most is Mates and Dates, so ACC's program to run in high schools. And we have about 12 mates and dates trained facilitators who are out there delivering that program. Um, we're set to run 110 modules this school year, which is pretty cool. And uh, as well as that, we also have our own schools program, which is called Who Are You? And that also has quite an interesting history. So that was, the development of that began in 2011, prior to that, but for the Rugby World Cup that was going to be happening in Wellington. So a short film was developed which shows how people can intervene and be an ethical bystander. And from that, a toolkit was developed to support use of that film because there was concern that if not really well facilitated, that the messages in that film could be taken in the wrong way. So that toolkit was made and that program is running in lots of different communities around the country because we've provided that for free. Our program, Who Are You, that we run in schools is different from that toolkit because we've adapted it on an ongoing basis based on the evaluations that we've had from it and also our own experience of delivering it. So it's a bit different to what's in the toolkit. That's what we call our program that we run in secondary schools. Aside from that, we have some other programs for youth. So um, we have with Sex and Ethics is still around, but not something that we run that often. So we also run a program called Friends, Fano and Flirting for people with intellectual or learning disabilities. 
and that program primarily we've run with young people, but we have also run with people up to in their 60s as well. And that is one of my favorite programs to facilitate. I've run that about four times with a local group from Wellington. And one of the cool things is that we've got to work with the same group of people over time. So we've all the facilitators, those of us facilitating it, have really got to know them quite well, which has been really cool. And that program is it's a really important program because often people with disabilities are excluded from any kind of sexuality education and also violence prevention education. Often people, I think, can be afraid to talk to people with disabilities about sex and sexuality and romantic relationships. And so a big part of that program has been sort of allowing the group to be able to say sex in the room and that that's okay and we can talk about that in that space and we can talk about relationships. Um, A lot of people in the group are already in relationships or previously been in relationships. And some people have also had some negative experiences. So it's been a really valuable program to run. And we've seen a lot of benefits to those people who've been doing it. In terms of what other things that we do, um, so with this year we've been doing a lot of work in workplaces. And we have a new program that we've developed this year called Workplace Sexual Harassment Prevention and Response. It covers more than just harassment. It's the full broad spectrum of sexual abuse. But um, we do focus on harassment in that and have strategically used that in the title because it is an easier way to get into workplaces. It's easier to kind of start the conversation around harassment, but also talk about those very serious things that happen as well, but do happen less frequently than harassment does. And that's a a four-hour program that educates people about what sexual harassment is, what other forms of sexual abuse are, and focuses on building their skills to be able to recognise that in the workplace particularly as a bystander, but also if it's happening to them and also if they're doing it themselves. So our evaluation data from that program shows that very close to 100% of people have reflected on their own behaviour during that program. We've had a lot of really good comments from people about how they specifically have done that or what specific behaviours they've reflected on. Often it's around considering that the outcome of what they do or say might be very different to their intention. So even though they meant it as a joke or to be friendly, that's not how it was perceived by the pers- the other person and therefore it is a problem regardless of whether they, int- even if they intended it to be very friendly and fun. Um, so that's been a really awesome piece of reflection from people. What a fantastic result in terms of evaluation of having 100% mm. of participants actually reflecting on their own behaviour mm. uh, within that program. That's really, really impressive. Mm and great that it, a program is um, looking at that full spectrum of, mm. you know, from those who might be harmful to those who might be victimised to those who are witnessing mm. either of those behaviours. Mm. Well done. Yeah. Thank you. Mm. In terms of other parts of the work that you're doing, is there anything else in the range? There's a lot that you are currently doing as an author. Yeah, yeah. I haven't even told you all of it. Um, <laughs> very briefly, we, we also work with the hospitality sector and we have a program called It's Our Business specifically for people working in hospitality around safety for customers, whereas that workplace program would be appropriate for them to do if they're talking about relationships with other staff. And then another program we run is Dealing with Disclosures, which is the sort of exception in terms of not being primary prevention, but is more about response to sexual harm. Yeah. As you've said in your intro, Fiona, you know, you've been working in the sector since 2013. That's now five years. Over your time in this, Mm. what are some of the significant shifts on multiple levels that you've observed that um, you think are quite significant to our moment, our historical moment that we're in? Yeah, it's interesting because five years is a short time compared to um, how long some other people have been working in the sector and how long they've been driving this work. But I think that in the time I've been here, I've seen massive shifts. And I think, as you say, it's it's a particular moment in time. So I feel very lucky to have sort of arrived in this sector in this time. It's been huge. I mean, in 2013, when I started out here, it was really hard to get people to want to have a prevention program in their group. The year before I started at SAPM, about seven programs had been run, reaching, I think, around 70 people. In my first year, we ran 70 programs. And we're now running, uh, last year we ran 136 
reaching 4,000 participants and will certainly exceed that this year. And that's a whole raft of reasons. And I think that the interesting one is that there is definitely a change happening in society and it's happening globally and it's happening in New Zealand. I think that we've seen a huge shift in discourse around sexual harm, but also in sort of related areas like gender and feminism. It, it's cool to be a feminist now. <laughs> it wasn't even in 2013. I used to run tutorials on theatre studies at university, but it was hard to get people to engage. And the feminist, the one where we looked at feminist theory, theory you'd have like two feminists in the room and then like 18 disengaged people. But um, that's something that certainly changed quite a lot. Yeah, and the last year in particular has been huge. Um, so there's been the Me Too movement and that, you know, enormously took off. And suddenly there are a lot of people from a range of different sectors who are really getting engaged in this. So, you know, we've seen the work that's been happening in the law profession and um, there's a lot of stuff starting to happen in universities. There are all these feminist clubs at, at high schools. There's, there's just so much going on. And all of that leads to to cultural change and it leads to it's it's sort of the background work to get people warmed up to them being ready to do a prevention program whereas previously we were having to start from scratch and kind of be like okay so here are some of the things I think when I started working here I remember having a lot of experiences of contacting groups and getting the response of oh no we don't have any of that here and that very rarely happens now that did happen once this year um, when I ended up at a meeting um, with the HR team at quite a large employer and they had been directed by someone more senior to meet with us. And <laughs> so they sort of started the meeting with, oh, we don't really know why we're here. Um, this isn't really a problem in our workplace. All our EAP results, um, the issues of depression and anxiety, there aren't really any issues around sexual harassment. I've never heard of it. And I think we did a good job of convincing them that that doesn't mean it's not happening and that the very nature of what this is means that it is something that's going to be really underreported. Um, we talked about those sort of reporting rates and the reluctance people have to report that to their employer or even to bring it to EAP, which they still see is associated with the employer, um, even though that information is not getting back to them. And also that maybe some of those trends in depression and anxiety are actually related to sexual harassment in the workplace. That could, that could be the case. So that attitude's still out there. <laughs> and I mean, of course, we're still a relatively small organisation in a relatively small number of workplaces. We have been growing pretty rapidly. Our reach has been growing pretty rapidly. And the demand is, is definitely there now. And we're sort of trying to find ways to keep up with that. And a question that popped into my head is, you know, if you were able to, you know, have unlimited resources as we all wish to have in the NGO sector in particular doing prevention, where would you like to see this work being taken to? What kind of other strategies would you like to see mm. being implemented? I mean, so the ultimate goal is to eliminate sexual harm, all kinds of sexual harm. And I do think that that is possible. And I do think that's possible to happen in my lifetime. And yeah, I guess we'll just keep going until we get there. In terms of specifically what I would want to do with that, I mean, like the, the key thing that we need is we need a national strategy for sexual violence prevention. And I'm involved in some work towards that. And I hope that that is something that the government ensures gets in place and that they put the resourcing behind it to make that happen. I think it's awesome that the Wellington City Council has put into their 10 year plan that Wellington is going to be the first sexual violence free city. That's an awesome, awesome goal. I got asked by a reporter when they made that goal whether that was possible, you know, like, oh, is that even, you know, that can't really happen, can it? And like 10 years, probably not going to happen, but the goal should not be any lower than that. The goal should absolutely be to make the whole city sexual violence free. Um, and that should always be the goal. And we just get as close to that goal as we possibly can. Because even if we've eliminated 99% of the cases or 99 out of 100, that one case that's still happening is way too many. So, yeah, in terms of how we get there, um, I want to see primary prevention education in all secondary schools and reaching all young people, including those outside of secondary school. And so alongside sexual violence prevention education, I also want to see really high quality sexuality education as well and education around gender. 
I want to see education and all workplaces as well. I think I often hear people kind of saying, like, oh, we need to educate all the young people. And yes, of course we do. But we also need to educate a lot of older people because all this work we're doing in schools, if they go into some of the workplaces that I've been working in recently, where the culture is completely the opposite of what we're trying, we've been educating them about in schools, that's the culture that they're going to learn once they're in that workplace because as humans, we learn behaviour by mimicking others and from what we're embedded in. And they should be doing that early in their careers. I'm sure there are like great role models there in terms of the work that they're doing. But if those role models are also exhibiting really bad interpersonal behaviours, then they're going to be learning those as well. So we need to see stuff happening in workplaces and in communities so that this education is getting to all adults as well. And particularly people in leadership roles need to have education and training so they can model really positive behaviours and they can model calling it out and doing something about it when something bad does happen. Yeah. I also think that education and training programs are a, a huge part of this, but there's a lot of other work around it as well. And we're involved in some of that in terms of policy development and creating resources and sort of sharing things on social media and that kind of stuff. I think there needs to be more positive messages in a range of different media so that there are things to listen to, things to watch. I think in popular TV shows, if the norm in a sex scene is that you see consent being asked for and given, then that would be awesome um, so that this becomes a really, really normal thing that people are seeing in every aspect of their lives. I just love your unquavering conviction that you're going to see the end of sexual violence in your lifetime. That's really yeah. brilliant. <laughs> and, and really, really positive yeah. to because I think often, um, oftentimes when, when people are doing this work, sometimes we can get a little jaded or a little overwhelmed by the enormity of the task. But yeah. your positivity <laughs> and clarity is very inspiring. So thank you. And it leads <laughs> really well to my next question is, what is your why in this work? How do you... How do you sustain that, that very clear vision that you have? I mean, I guess my why is, yeah, the sort of things I've said that I really do think that any instance of sexual violence is too many, and I really do think it is, it's all preventable and none of it should be happening. And so that's why I want to work towards this goal of ending all sexual violence. It's a huge global problem, but we also have shockingly high rates in New Zealand. And I, yeah, I just think it has to end. <laughs> That's why I do it. Um, in terms of how I sustain myself, I think that the work, I really do think that the work that we do at Sexual Abuse Prevention Network and the work that other organisations in our sector do is really valuable and it is really effective. Um, and I think that we are seeing change. I think working in this work at this time is fantastic because as we've talked about we've seen a lot of change across society and so we're seeing these really big cultural shifts and I know that we are part of making that happen and part of leading that so that's certainly something that helps drive me to continue with this. Fabulous and you talked a lot about um, that kind of interconnectedness as well around all of our services and how we're all kind of part of this together. I'm wondering mm -hmm. if you can share in particular for those who might be interested in starting this journey or want to get involved in sexual violence prevention or just sexual violence work in general. I wonder if you could share any kind of big learning moments that you've had while, while doing this work? Yeah, so I've learned an enormous amount in the time that I've been working in this sector and I put a lot of that down to the enormous wealth of knowledge and generosity of people I've worked with. So I learned a lot from the three agencies involved in the collaboration of Sexual Abuse Prevention Network. There are staff there who just have, have so much knowledge and have been working in this area a long time. And so I've learned a lot from them. I think also, yeah, I think, oh gosh, I don't know. I don't know what else to say other than that. Maybe I'll just leave it there. Yeah. <laughs> okay, you can leave it there. Yeah. Uh, we're coming to the end of our, our mm. interview today and I'm wondering if there's any last reflections you'd like to leave with the sector and those beyond the sector around around all of this work and, and what we could do more to work together. 
I think our sector does some incredible work. And one thing I've found really amazing being part of this sector is the community and the connections between agencies and the generosity. Um, you know, we do a lot of that via teleconference and I feel like I've got to know a lot of people working in different communities all around the country. And people are really open and willing to share what they're doing. There's not a real competitiveness between different agencies, which there could be, but there isn't. People see it as part of the bigger picture and the, and the ultimate goal of ending sexual violence. And they want to support each other to do that and ensure that we get education and lots of initiatives happening in communities all around the country. Great. Thank you, Fiona. And it's been so great to hear more about you and your um, and your passion for this work. So I'm really, really grateful for this interview and I'm sure others will find it really interesting. And this is where we're going to end. And I think um, Fiona's like passion and <laughs> vision and clarity and connectedness with the sector is really the purpose of these podcasts is to get to know each other better and ultimately foster our, our great work in, in seeing the end of sexual violence happening. And I'm going to add it in our lifetime because we yeah. can achieve this. So Awesome. Yeah, we absolutely can. Yeah. So thank you very much. Cool. We'll end this here and we will be, see you all in the next episode within the next few months.